All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. We are going to go ahead and get started tonight. Uh, thank you all so much uh, for joining us for uh, tonight's program. Uh, my name is Pat Kane. Oops. Apologies. Apologies about that. I'm not sure if you guys were hearing that. I had a video playing on the other end. But uh, uh, again, good evening, everybody. My name is Pat Kane, uh, Public Programs, the Visitor Services Coordinator at the Museum of the Grand Prairie, part of the Champaign County Forest Preserve District. Uh, and thank you all so much for joining us tonight for a very special program uh, titled Maple Sugar Days, Remembering John Garvey. Uh, I want to especially thank John Garvey for this presentation he gave last year and for our director um, and John's wife, Barb Garvey, for joining us as well. I'll bring Barb on in just a few short moments um, uh, for tonight's program. Before we do get into tonight's program, I um, uh, did want to, uh, Dominique says we were able to hear you and can hear you now. Okay, great. Um, uh, but before we get into tonight's program, did want to go over a few things, um, uh, let you know um, about a few items happening in tonight's program. Uh, and then we will go ahead and get started. So first, uh, let us know where you're watching from tonight. I always like to see where folks are tuning in from tonight. Um, so write down in the comment section below if you're comfortable uh, uh, where you're tuning in from tonight. Um, I'm streaming live from my home in Champaign, Illinois. Would love to know where you all are watching from tonight. So write that down in the comment section below if you wouldn't mind. Um, also, uh, tonight we're going to learn a lot about uh, maple sugaring, maple tree tapping, but also uh, uh, tonight we'd like to encourage the sharing of memories of our dear friend John Garvey. So if you have any questions about maple tree tapping or maple sugaring, um, or you'd like to share a memory of John, uh, uh, please write those down in the comments section. Uh, we would love to see those and, and we will share ours as well during tonight's program. A little bit about us, if you don't know anything about us, Museum of the Grand Prairie opened originally in 1968 as the Early American Museum, um, uh, and our current mission is to collect, preserve, and interpret the cultural and natural history of Champaign County and East Central Illinois for all generations. Uh, we're part of the Champaign County Forest Preserve District, which is a collection of seven forest preserves here in Champaign County and East Central Illinois, two educational facilities, including our museum, as well as the Homer Lake Interpretive Center at Homer Lake Forest Reserve, uh, Lake of the Woods Golf Course, Kickapoo Rail Trail, and so much more here in East Central Illinois. Uh, for more info about the Museum of the Grand Prairie and Champaign County Forest Preserve District, uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about us, feel free to check us out at museumofthegrandprairie.org, ccfp.org, or you can find us on social media. Um, so have some folks letting us know where they're watching from tonight. Eileen tuning in from Champaign, Dominique from Urbana, um, Isabella tuning in from home, uh, Myra from Northern Michigan, Lori from Champaign, Nike from Highland Park, um, uh, Megan from near Fisher, Katie from Urbana, uh, and Ryan from Columbus, Ohio. Thank you all so much for tuning in tonight. Thank you for letting us know where you're watching from down in the comments section below. Um, uh, now I'm going to, I'm pleased to bring on uh, Barb Garvey. Barb, you there? Can you see me? Yep, can you hear I'm me? here. I can see you. I can hear you. <laughs> okay. I'm so happy to see so many um, old friends watching. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Barb, uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, Barb, sure. as I as I mentioned uh, before, is director of the Museum and Education Department at the Champaign County Forest Preserve District, um, and John Garvey's wife. Um, so, did want to talk a little bit about um, uh, tonight's program a little bit. Talk a little bit about John uh, for those of you who may not know him. Uh, uh, John Garvey volunteered countless hours of his time with the museum and Forest Preserve District over the last few decades. Uh, just a few of the things that John helped us with included providing cooking demonstrations, translating materials into French, and for many years, uh, John shared his hobby of maple tree tapping and maple sugaring with hundreds of visitors during our annual Maple Sugar Days programs at Homer Lake Forest Preserve. Uh, John passed away last year, uh, and this was a huge loss for his family, uh, friends, community members, uh, fellow goers at Holy Cross Church, fellow faculty and students at University High School, uh, and us at the Museum of the Grand Prairie and Champaign County Forest Preserve District. Uh, during previous Maple Sugar Days programs specifically, uh, John shared his passion for the hobby of maple sugaring. And as a natural educator, John always did such an amazing job of sharing this passion with visitors of all ages during this popular annual program. Uh, I like to think that this program was not only popular because it was an interesting topic, but it was also popular for the reputation John helped to build for the program in recent years. 
Um, I had the pleasure of working with John on these programs since 2018, and we'll continue to carry on these programs in the future uh, in John's memory. Uh, John is and will continue to be deeply missed by us at CCFPD and the Museum of the Grand Prairie, as well as many, many others throughout the CU community and beyond. Uh, tonight, um, in just a few moments, we're going to share a virtual program that was completed last year in late February 2021, where John and I worked together to provide the very first uh, uh, version, first virtual version of uh, our Maple Sugar Days program. Uh, so we invite you to join us in learning more about history and science behind maple sugaring, as well as how to tap maple trees of your own. Also, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we would like this for we would like for this to be an opportunity to remember John, since this was a passion that he cared a lot about and helped us so much with. So uh, again, please share your memories with us of John down in the comment section below. Write those down below. And again, also if you have any questions about maple sugaring, maple tree tapping. Uh, Barb and I can do our best to answer those questions at the end as well. After the broadcast, we'll come back on. Barb and I will come back on to uh, uh, the live stream here, share a few memories of our own, um, and share some of the memories that you all share with us in the comments section as well. So we want to thank you all for attending, um, and we invite you to join us in remembering uh, our dear friend, uh, John Garvey. So Barb, uh, uh, did you have anything you'd like to say as well? Well, sure. I mean, you know, 40 years worth of uh, marriage left a lot of memories, but I won't bore you with all of those. <laughs> and I'll try to keep this really short because I will have a tendency to get maudlin and John would want to identify, would want to give you the etymology of that word, which is pretty interesting, but I'm not going to go there. Um, what I will say is that I think that this program is perfect distillation of who John was. It was about being outdoors. You love the outdoors. You, I used to joke that if there was an apocalypse, I'd be okay because he could cook anything anywhere and make a fire anywhere. And that's pretty much part of this program, right? And, um, and he was teaching, which he loved to do. And he was cooking, which he loved to do. And both of those things are, um, were how he liked to serve others and that was his whole life so i'll stop there because i will get maudlin <laughs> and we can show the show the program but enjoy <laughs> thanks barb um so uh again i'm going to show this uh this broadcast from this program uh, that happened last year 2021 um uh, with john garvey so uh barb and i will go away uh, and then this this broadcast will start momentarily after uh, we leave the screen. So here we go. Uh, and uh, I also wanted to um, uh, bring on uh, John Garvey. Before we get into tonight's program, introduce you guys to John Garvey. Um, let me pull uh, John in real quick. There's John. Hey, John, how you doing? I'm good. Thanks, Pat. Yeah. Um, uh, so John is going to help us with tonight's program. Him and I are going to uh, uh, tag team tonight's program. Uh, and uh, and uh, to introduce John to you all, John, again, as I mentioned before, is a volunteer who helps us with this program uh, each year. Uh, John teaches French and computer literacy courses at University High School. Um, uh, on the University of Illinois campus in Urbana. And also, uh, John has been tapping maple trees um, in his own backyard for years uh, to make maple syrup um, uh, for himself and his family. And uh, he's going to talk a little bit more about uh, uh, tree identification and how you could tap these trees and process your own syrup uh, in tonight's presentation. So with that, again, we're going to um, get into tonight's program. So I'm going to share my screen really quick. And we're going to go ahead. We're going to go ahead and get going with tonight's program. So bear with me just for a moment. Oh, whoops. Hmm. Okay. Come on. There we go. Okay, so Maple Sugar Days, the virtual edition, uh, going to get into tonight's program. Going to talk a lot about 
uh, the history behind uh, maple tree tapping, uh, science behind it, and then also get into how you can tap trees of your own uh, to make your very own maple syrup in tonight's presentation. So breakfast, I don't know about you all, but breakfast is by far my, my most favorite meal of the entire day. And breakfast would not be complete in many cases without maple syrup on top of some pancakes, some French toast, some waffles, what have you, like is pictured here. So we're gonna talk about that important breakfast staple tonight, maple syrup. Gonna talk about uh, maple trees, got some bark showing up there on top of the pancakes. Gonna talk about how you can identify uh, maple trees, uh, again, going to talk about the history of maple tree tapping, uh, how, uh, how long it's been going on, um, who has been tapping maple trees, um, especially in this area. And then lastly, as we already mentioned, how can you tap some trees of your very own to make your own maple syrup? So a brief history of maple tree tapping. There's, we can go into great detail about this, but uh, just briefly, uh, maple sugaring is uh, unique to North America. So even though Europeans, uh, they also have maple trees in Europe, the climate that we have here in North America, especially where we live um, and other parts of, of the country that have similar climates to where we are in central Illinois, uh, makes it a great place for maple tree tapping. The reason for that is, we'll talk about it a little bit later, is um, uh, we have typically here in this area in late February and early March, uh, the Goldilocks conditions, the perfect conditions uh, to tap maple trees. And those perfect conditions uh, need to be um uh weather consistent weather consistent days where we have the temperature above freezing above 32 degrees fahrenheit during the day and then dropping below freezing at nighttime below 32 degrees fahrenheit at night and when we have those conditions those temperature conditions happening day after day it really opens the door for maple tree tapping to take place it's the best time to do that and typically here in central illinois when we see that is late February, early March. So the reason behind planning this program for tonight, February 11th, is even though right now in central Illinois, it's pretty dang cold. It's been cold for quite a few days in a row. Uh, right now would not be the best time to go tap some trees. You go put a, a tap in a tree right now, uh, you're not gonna get anything. But the idea is, is that once it starts to warm up here in hopefully a few weeks, uh, where we get those Goldilocks conditions in late February and early March, you will be able to go out and tap some trees if you want to make your own maple syrup. And again, that climate um, is uh, a great here in North America, especially here in Central Illinois. And Native Americans have been tapping maple trees for centuries, especially in this area, long before European settlers arrived in North America. Native Americans use maple syrup not only for sweetening, but as sustenance and even in uh, uh, as a form of currency, maybe bartering with some maple syrup uh, to trade for some other things that Native Americans uh, may have wanted from other European settlers or other Native American groups. Uh, how was maple syrup discovered? So most historians who have studied this topic uh, believe that Native American groups introduced maple sugar and syrup making to Europeans. That's a, a good consensus of those who study this topic. However, there is no firm proof or written record uh, to completely prove this, this theory. However, there are a number of legends out there and stories um, uh, behind when uh, Native Americans discovered maple syrup. And I wanted, to read, I wanted to read you one of these stories that I typically read each year at the Maple Sugar Days program. So this is a Native American uh, Iroquois legend about the discovery of tapping maple trees to make maple syrup. So it goes as this. So the first maple syrup maker uh, was believed to be an Iroquois woman, the wife of Chief Waxies. One late winter morning, the story goes, the chief headed out on one of his hunts, but not before yanking his tomahawk from the tree where he'd thrown it the night before. On this particular day, the weather turned quite warm, causing the tree's sap to run and fill a container standing near the tree trunk. The woman spied the vessel and thinking it was plain water, cooked their evening meal in it. The boiling that ensued turned the sap to syrup, flavoring the chief's meal as never before. And thus began the tradition of making maple syrup. That's one Iroquois legend. Uh, as people normally ask at this program each year, how 
did Native Americans figure out that you could put a hole into a tree, sap would come out, and you could heat it up for a long period of time, and eventually have maple syrup. And one Native American legend uh, goes like that for the discovery of maple syrup. So how did they do it? Uh, before metal spiles that John will show you a little bit later uh, and sugar shacks, Native Americans would make a V-shaped cut into the tree and they would insert, as it's pictured here, a hollowed out reed or branch, uh, basically like a wooden straw into the tree. And then underneath, like it's pictured here, they would take birch bark buckets or other containers to collect large amounts of sap because it takes quite a large amount of sap in order to make maple syrup. You have to collect 40 ounces of maple sap from the tree, heat it up for a long period of time, boil it down, create a whole bunch of steam. You have to collect 40 ounces of maple sap to make one ounce of maple syrup. So you have to collect a large amount of sap to do so. And Native Americans did in birch buckets using these hollowed out reeds and branches uh, uh, shoved into trees. And then, as I just mentioned, uh, you have to remove all of the water from uh, the maple sap to leave more and more of the sugar content behind, leaving you with that syrupy consistency. So how do you do that? How do you remove the water? Um, and without boiling, without metal pots, um, uh, how did Native Americans do it before they ran into uh, some metal pots that they may have traded with other groups? Well, one uh, option is uh, using uh, the method uh, known as fractional freezing. So this would be a method that was used before metal pots, or I guess you could use it if it's your preferred method. So uh, as we see in this picture here, there's a large amount of sap collected in this uh, tree container, this hollowed out log. And what would be done is uh, overnight, you would leave the buckets of sap out uh, to partially freeze. The water freezing, rising to the top and then leaving the sugar down below. And then you would remove the ice, uh, remove the water from the sap um, until, and then continue this fractional freezing process until you're left with a, a higher concentration of sugar and syrup that is left over in the birch bucket. So as I mentioned in the morning, they removed that top layer of ice. And after several days, it would take quite a long time, the remaining sugar um, uh, would be left in the bucket, in the container uh, that looks more and more like syrup. Another method that Native Americans used before uh, heating it up over an open flame in something like a campfire, uh, Native Americans would also uh, heat up some stones, uh, make them very, very hot, and then put them in a container, much like this container here. Um, so as I mentioned before, Native Americans uh, are believed to discover uh, maple tree tapping and maple sugaring and introduce it to Europeans. Here is an image of uh, a sugar shack that uh, European settlers would uh, create and these sugar shacks would pop up all over uh, central Illinois um, and other regions in North America with similar climate to here in central Illinois. And these sugar shacks would be uh, these places where you could uh, collect a large amount of sap and heat up a large amount of uh, maple sap in order to make maple syrup, large amounts of maple syrup. And this photo was taken by Frank Sidoris, um, uh, Sidoris, Illinois, uh, the namesake uh, uh, town. And this, this photo is housed at the Illinois State Museum uh, that Frank Sidoris took of the Sugar Shack in 1910. Um, so that's just a brief history of maple tree tapping. And now we're gonna get into a little bit of the science behind it. So I talked a little bit about um, why uh, maple tree tapping here in central Illinois typically happens in late February and early March because most often, historically, we see the Goldilocks conditions, the perfect conditions for maple tree tapping, where it's above freezing during the daytime and below freezing at nighttime. Well, what exactly is happening with those trees throughout the year? Well, we're going to watch this short video that will describe a little bit about that uh, process. And typically being associated with late winter and early spring, it actually starts in the warmth of the summer. You see, while some of us are on summer vacation, the maple tree is hard at work. Using massive amounts of water from the roots and the process of photosynthesis in the leaves, trees are continuously converting carbon dioxide into carbohydrates, or sugar. 
Because like us, they use these carbohydrates as fuel throughout the year. But also like us, the tree knows that the peak production during summer won't last indefinitely. Because come winter, the temperatures will be too low to move that much water. So like a wise homesteader, the tree saves up its excess fuel and stores it for future use. In autumn, once its season of fuel production is complete, the tree prepares to go dormant by discarding its no longer useful leaves to the ground, where they may eventually decompose and return their nutrients to the soil. As the temperatures fall below freezing, that massive column of water solidifies in place, trapping and compressing tiny bubbles of carbon dioxide. And as they compress, it creates a vacuum which pulls up the last remaining liquid water from the roots. Then for four or five months, every winter, as snow falls all around it, the tree simply rests, confident that its hard work will pay off in the spring. Because as soon as the daytime temperatures once again begin to rise above freezing, the warmth of the sun melts the water, which in turn allows those bubbles of carbon dioxide to re-expand, creating pressures which force the water up into the branches, carrying some of that stored fuel with it. This wakes up the tree and allows it to begin producing new leaves so that it can start the process all over again. And that's where we come in. Because when the tree is tapped with a spile, it creates an opening where some of that pressurized sugary water can escape. And that's why maple syrup season typically falls between February and April, depending on the location, because it's the cycle of below freezing nights followed by above freezing days, which causes those bubbles to contract and expand, forcing the sap up and down the tree. But once the temperatures settle out and the leaves begin to grow, the flow stops and maple syrup season ends until the following spring. But luckily for us, we're not quite there yet. All right, so we see the, the life cycle of the maple tree throughout the year, what it's doing in each season. And then also video highlighted again, that perfect season for maple tree tapping that we're getting ready to get into here in central Illinois, where we have above freezing temperatures during the day and below freezing temperatures at night. Those conditions creating almost like a natural pump, pumping up life into the tree, pumping up sap into the tree, which could eventually uh, could be uh, the tree could be spiled and you could collect sap with your very own. And typically being associated with late. All right. So I'm going to turn it over to John. John's going to talk a little bit about um, how to identify uh, maple trees. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Thanks, Pat. Um, oops. I'm hearing myself echo. OK, that's better. Um, Generally, most of us know what a maple leaf looks like. You, you should recognize that there are multiple types of maple trees. The best ones to use are clearly uh, what are called sugar maples. I'll show you a picture of their, uh, their leaves here in a moment. Um, there are other maples that are native to around here. There are also silver maples. If you're familiar with silver maples, they tend to be very fast growing trees. They're not very strong. They do have sap. The sap does have sugar in it. They can be tapped and they can be boiled down, but in terms of overall productivity and quality of, quality of syrup, what you want to look for is the sugar maples. If you could go ahead a little bit and we could look at the leaves. Right, okay. So you can see that there is a significant difference. The sugar maple is probably the most typical maple in a picture book looking maple leaf that you would have. Um, they, uh, they have smooth edges between the lobes and the red and the silver have more toothy edges. They're smaller. Uh, and uh, in, the, in the winter, in the fall, the, um, the sugar maples are going to turn, generally turn a much brighter red than the other two do. But as I say, they all can be tapped. Um, the reason I started doing this in the first place was because about 20 years ago, my wife realized I was getting restless for the garden about this time of year and there wasn't much to be done. But we have three maple, three maple trees in my yard, and um, two of them are sugar maples, one's a silver. And so she got me some spiles. I'll show you what those look like in a few minutes. And I just started this without any of the science, without any really knowledge. Um, I should back up a second, because when I first uh, learned to tap maple trees was more than 40 years ago. I, I was in, uh, I was glad to see yeah, the Pennsylvania people were here because I was in college in Western Maryland in the mountains. And uh, I had a class where we did learn to tap maple trees. It was 
basically biology for non-majors. And um, Maryland, Western Maryland, Maryland is not a place that you think of for um, being able to tap maple trees, but we were cold enough and high enough that we were able to do it. Normally you think much more New England and Canada for that, but it, we're, we're at the Southern limit of where you can do it here, but it still does work. And generally uh, with the three trees, I can get um, 40 gallons of syrup, 40 gallons of sap uh, from my trees. Uh, you could go one more, Patrick, I think. Yeah, the other way that you rec recognize the sugar maple from the silver maple, the sugar maple uh, spinny um, seeds are somewhat smaller. They tend to um, fall further from the tree than the, uh, the silver maple because they are smaller, they can fly further. Um, but this also requires you to plan ahead uh, if you're looking in the summertime, you have to look in the summertime for when the leaves are uh, a little slightly higher version of recognizing the tree. If you if you do a little bit of research, you can find the, the barks of the different maple trees are significantly different, too. So if you want to use that as an identification, that's also possible. So that was that was my brief introduction to that. Pat will talk about what we actually have available as a facility around here. Yeah, so at uh, uh, Champaign County Forest Preserve District, when we do this program each year, we typically do it at Homer Lake Forest Preserve because there is a historic 200-year-old uh, maple sugar grove where we host these programs each year um, where uh, maple trees have been tapped for uh, over two centuries uh, there. Um, and then here's a picture of that maple sugar grove. As you can see, uh, of course, there's a group of us uh, uh, gathered around the fire where John is uh, sharing all of his wisdom about how to how to uh, make your own maple syrup. And then you can also see uh, some buckets. Uh, some trees are tapped here, some buckets, some pails, uh, collecting some sap from these trees uh, eventually uh, that will be uh, heated up uh, to create some maple syrup. Here's another picture uh, just to give you an idea of what the maple sugar grove looks like. Uh, as John was mentioning, another way you can identify these trees is if you're really good at it uh, in the winter time, uh, you can identify them by bark. Uh, I've got quite a few maple trees in this maple sugar grove at Homer Lake. And we got, uh, again, uh, you know, we have this program each year and uh, show people how to tap trees of all ages, uh, trees of all ages and uh, uh, visitors of all ages, how to tap their own trees. And then here's uh, John on the fire talking about the processing phase uh, uh, at Homer Lake Forest Preserve. And uh, I believe that's what John's gonna talk about next. If you wanna tap your own trees and make your own maple syrup, how do you do it? Well, John, I'll let you tell him a little bit more about that. Very good. Okay, so you've identified the trees and the amount of equi uh, equipment that you need is relatively small. Really the most uh, specific, sophisticated thing is a spile. I don't know if you can see me holding it up, but the spile is at the top there. But these are my spiles. I have four or five of these. I'm zooming out on my camera. Uh, and they are come specifically made so that they will fit easily into a hole that you bore into the tree with a hook that uh, hangs down below so that you can hang a bucket for them. When I first uh, when I first started doing this, I did not have a powerful enough battery powered drill, so I had to carry a long extension cord to my <laughs> to my uh, um, the trees in my yard with the with the regular old electric drill. But since they've gotten better, and I have a more powerful one now, the the significant thing you need is um, you have a picture of a five sixteen seventeen sixteen drill bit. I generally use uh, this type if I can hold it up a little closer. I use a spade bit type because it drills a nice clean hole relatively quickly. Uh, you can use any kind of drill bit, but it should be no bigger than half an inch, minus, minus half an inch. Um, and you drill it in about, um, well, well, we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, buckets are there for collecting the sap. If you look up uh, even, even amateur um, um, uh, maple uh, maple syrup making, you're likely to find people who use, uh, multi, if they have multiple trees, if they have a small forest of their own, uh, there'll be a lot of people who use uh, spiles with tubes connected to them, uh, which will connect, collect in a large tub or a large bucket. That would be very handy. But I use a small bucket. I have a um, basically just these paint buckets that I bought at the hardware store. And they fill up, on a good day, they will fill up several times. Um, I think that's a 
three quart bucket and it fills up several times. And so even though it seems very daunting, if you if you actually hope to get, as Patrick said, it's 40 to one, you start with, um, with 40 gallons of sap, which kind of is a lot, um, you will end up only ideally with an, a gallon of syrup. We never get that much. I'll get a couple quarts on a good year. Um, but uh, you know, you're just con constantly collecting the buckets and dumping them into a larger holding bucket. And I usually wait till I have ten gallons or so, uh, and then I start to. Uh, the hammer, by the way, <laughs> the pictured hammer is really just to gently tap the spile into the um, into the hole that you drill in the tree. And it's a it's a very rite of spring for me every year when I when I drill the first hole and tap the first pile in and that first drop that comes out and they start to pour immediately. If you've got the weather right and if you've got the, uh, the conditions are right, they don't they don't wait to start dripping. Um, sometimes it's very satisfying they'll start gushing. Um, the and and now I say that and I keep wanting to to back off. If you're at all concerned about any damage to the tree, don't be. Uh, as long as you don't over tap, and we'll talk about the numbers of, of um, holes you can actually do in a given tree, um, the, 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 the tree heals itself very quickly. Before the summer, before the summer comes, um, my, the holes in my trees are healed up. Uh, and they are, and it doesn't sh show any lasting damage to them at all. You don't do it in the same place. You rotate, rotate around the tree every year a little bit, go up a little bit, go down a little bit. So it's not in the same place. But uh, the amount of sap that you're taking from the tree, relatively speaking, is negligible. Uh, it is making lots, lots, lots more for itself and using it all. So, um, I mean, I, I, I can see how we want to think about the poor tree that we are making suffer, but it does not suffer. And um, yeah, so could you go on one slide? Let me see what the next one is. Right, okay, so you would drill a hole angle it a little bit so that there is a, a downward slope um, in the hole so ultimately the spile is dripping into the bucket not straight out it will work if it's straight out this is not a this is not hard science here but it does tend to make it um, a little bit better you only want to go about two inches in uh, but most of the time your drill will only allow you to do that anyway the spile is going to fit in place so you're not going to do damage if it goes if it goes further uh, could you move one more, please? All right, and that's what it looks like when the spile goes into the hole. The uh, they are made so that they are they they are basically little funnels, and the uh, there's they they fit in tightly into the hole so nothing leaks around them, and then you hang the bucket from that hook. And the next slide. Now, this shows relatively. I've never I've never tended to worry about this because my trees I'm happy with one hole per tree. But if you get thicker and older, we could do this in the maple grove. Several of them would easily take three taps um, without even without even um, showing any wear. Because uh, some of them are quite old and some of them are quite big. Uh, a maple tree, I just learned this today, a, a sugar maple tree can live a long time. Some of them are three or 400 years old. Not the ones we have around here, I don't think. But there are ones up in Canadian woods that are, are that old. Um, so. Multiple taps is possible if you wanted to, to, if you have a large tree and you wanted to, you know, maximize your, your production. Okay, move along one more, please. All right. And as the, as the sap pours into the buckets, you collect it. Now, the buckets that we have out at, uh, out at Homer Lake, they are uh, slightly larger and they do have the advantage of having little um, covers made for them so that one of the disadvantages of doing this is the weather's weather can be very variable. It can rain, it can snow again, everything could freeze up. Um, or what was the least pleasant is towards the end of the season, it starts to get warmer and everything is coming alive and everything is coming out. And so you start to get insects interested in this very mildly sugary water. For, for us, it looks absolutely clear. If you rub your hands in it, if you dip your fingers in it, you'll get a little bit of a, a tacky feel, a little stickiness to it. But you would really have to be a very creative imaginer to taste it and think that there was any sugar in it at all uh, at the at the first thing. But the bugs like it and the animals like it. So having a cover for it is really helpful. But generally, I mean, I'll, I'll mention this in a few minutes, but I do a lot of filtering. So anything that does fall into it, rain is not going to be you know, dramatically a harmful thing. If it freezes, it melts again. So 
there's a lot of there's a lot of nature happening when you're doing this. Okay, go on ahead. Well, all right. So as you as you pour the sap into your buckets, you I have I have several large, as I said, five gallon collecting buckets, um, and I and I fill a couple of those before I start doing any cooking. Um, you want to filter it, whether it's for pieces of bark or animal drop. No, I don't want to say droppings, but uh, bits that fall from the tree. Um, you filter all that out into the main bucket, so you have a relatively clear liquid to start with. Uh, I use a lot of cheesecloth and a, and a uh, just a basic kitchen sieve while I'm doing this. Um, and filtering is going to to continue as you cook, but. Uh, Having, having it as clean as possible to start with saves you a lot of time. Um, we'll see in a moment what it looks like when it's boiling down, but I'm just trying to think, do I want to mention anything else? This, this picture that you see here is really rather late in the stages when I'm starting to cook it on a smaller stove. Um, okay, next one. All right, so boiling it down. What I, I've, I've changed my setup from the beginning. When I, when I first started doing it on, on the back porch of my house, uh, it was very long, <laughs> very, took a long time, uh, still takes quite a long time, but um, I would use essentially a roasting pan, that uh, the type that you might cook a turkey in or something, and I would set it up on a camp stove um, and then just use propane to, um, to continually add, add sap to that. As it boils down, and it will boil down, it starts looking like you see in that pan there, uh, but it will start to, to, to foam up. You skim off the foam. There's a lot of skimming with the filter as well. Um, you, uh, you, I, I can continue to add cups or quarts of uh, sap as I go. And I'll just do this. I, it doesn't require a lot of watching at this point. I'll just set it to boil and leave it. Uh, come back in half an hour, 45 minutes, and add some more, and add some more, and add some more. It'll go on and on. And I'm collecting sap all the time. I can stop it at any point. Um, usually, I'll come home from work, and I'll uh, boil sap for three or four hours until it's time to stop, and put a lid on it, and let it, let it sit for the next day. Uh, if you were doing this in any kind of professional or large-scale thing, obviously, you wouldn't do that. You would do everything you could all at once. But I'm a hobbyist, and it still works, and it uh, still gets syrup. So I continue to add sap, as I say, uh, as as long as I'm getting it, and as long as it, the trees are producing it, I will continue to add it. I don't have to do it in separate batches. Um, really, the science behind this is that there is sugar in this sap, um, and just like if you dissolve some sugar in water and then boil it down, the more you boil it, the more the water. Uh, evaporates, the more the sugar is going to be concentrated in the um, in the liquid that you have. Uh, the more sugar there is and the less water there is, the higher the boiling point. So as it gets thicker and gets darker and gets more syrupy, um, it's gonna it's gonna boil less. Uh, it's still gonna be heating, but it's gonna be less of a vigorous boil. So there is a there is a process that is going on with this all the time. And then if you add more sap to it, it dilutes it again, and then you just keep doing this. My sap my syrup tends to be a little dark, probably more dark than you would see in the store. That is not a question of quality. It's just because it has been uh, reduced almost to a syrup state multiple times, but it still tastes good and it still works exactly the same way as it would for syrup. Um, so let's see. So I continue to add the raw sap. I'm just looking at my notes to make sure I'm not forgetting to tell you anything. All right, go ahead. All right, and then uh, <laughs> there's a there's a line that we usually use early on. The reason all of this is done outside, as I just alluded to, we've got 40, 40 gallons of sap, say, getting ultimately um, one gallon of syrup. That means you've gotten rid of 35 gallons of water into the air. If you try to do this indoors, especially inside your house, uh, we always say you just lose all the wallpaper in your house. It it it's it is not a good idea to try to do any of this in, in, in indoors except the very end when i've gotten down to no more sap and my um the, uh, the the stuff that i'm boiling in the pan starts to really seem and you know you taste it you take a spoon and you stick your finger in it or whatever uh it tastes like syrup and it's getting sticky it's a little bit more syrupy than it was for all this time then i usually will put it into a pot 
and bring it indoors. Because uh, when it gets to the end, when it gets close to the end, um, it's it's tricky. And it can go very quickly from uh, pourable, usable maple syrup to basically sugar. And, and rock sugar. It's not, it, you, you can do that on purpose, but you got to be very careful. What you're doing, what you're trying to do now is to get it, if you've done any kind of candy making or um, or caramel making, anything of that sort, uh, you're trying to get it to the, uh, the um, uh, about 230 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the syrup, the syrup stage. Uh, if it goes more than that, it will start to crystallize and it won't um, won't be useful as syrup. It'll be, it'll taste good, be lovely if you wanted to just have sugared maple. But um, at that point, you need to stop it. And then probably I would filter it one more time. There's probably been three or four filters in this stage too. A lot of the reason the filtering happens at this point is not because um, not because stuff has fallen into it, but because you're dealing with an organic substance that's come out of a tree, and there's a lot of um, uh, sedimentary minerals and other other things that are in there that are just natural to the thing. One of the reasons people say maple syrup is actually a relatively healthy thing to to use is that it has a high volume of magnesium in it. Um, which is not typical for other sugars that we use in our diet. Um, there was a time when people were trying to sell bottled sap on the basis that this was a healthy alternative to water, simply because there was a low quantity of magnesium in it. But um, it, uh, it, you know, you you are filtering out. There's a there's a term they use for when you get towards the end. It's called sugar sand. There is a, a silty grit that accumulates in the bottom of the pan. And that is just what's coming out of the sap. It's uh, just reduced from, um, you know, as the sap reduces, it comes and, and uh, looking for the word, it is just sediment. So let me see if I have anything else I would like to tell you at this point. Okay, nope, that's it. And I'll answer questions and when we're done. I hope that that was at least a little bit helpful. And I, and I do wanna reiterate, I went into this knowing nothing. Um, the internet has, in the meantime, caught up with a lot of information, and I can look stuff up. The spiles that I have, I bought online. Um, that I have replaced the original ones because they've been around for a long time. But otherwise, there's no sophisticated equipment. I use a bigger propane burner than I did in the first place because um, uh, it cooks faster. And I would love to have enough firewood to do it over a fire. That would really be ideal and much less expensive. Um, but uh, it, it keeps me busy. This year has been frustrating because uh, we were kind of hoping that there would be something happening already, but absolutely not. Last year was interesting because it was very start, but stop and start. We had some cold and then we had some warm and then we had some cold and we had some warm and that's okay. Uh, if it starts to freeze during the day, it will stop, but it also will start again. If it starts to get warm at night, it will also stop, but if it then freezes again, it will start again. Uh, so as long as you have that cycle going, it will keep going for a while. Sometimes I will be doing this for a month. Uh, sometimes it's only a couple of weeks, but um, it, uh, it it's worth it in the long run. Not for me, I don't like maple syrup, but um, I like to give it away. So um, it's it, it has proved it has proved interesting and it and it uh, something that I can do on a regular basis. Okay. Well, thanks, John. Uh, you know, I know you've you've got uh, quite a bit of experience doing this. You know, just as you said, you know, you're you're a hobbyist, and uh, you know, and 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 doing it. And I always find it uh, interesting that you just said you don't even like maple syrup, but you're such, you're such a nice guy that you make it for everybody else. And, I know that, and before you've used it um, in cooking too. Adding I like to cook and that sort yeah. of thing. So. Um, it's so, good in uh, whipped cream. what'd you say, John? I said it's good in whipped cream. Oh yeah, yeah, certainly. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, we typically do this program in person um, and try to, you know, have some maple syrup on hand that you can try for the program. But of course, we can't do that since we're doing it virtually. But um, where could you buy maple syrup in Central Illinois locally made? You know, people going through this process that John was just talking about. Um, where can you buy it in Central Illinois? Um, so, 
if, if you're not in central Illinois, check to see if there are any local processors in your area. Maybe there's some uh, people who make their own maple syrup in your area, have some sugar shacks around. Uh, uh, check it out. Do a quick Google search and see if that exists in your area. Here in central Illinois, there's a handful that I was going to mention um, close by in a neighboring county, uh, part of Vermilion County Conservation District. Over at Forest Glen Preserve, they uh, do a similar program. Uh, they have maple sugar days. They tap maple trees and make quite a bit of it uh, to sell. And I think sometimes they give it away. But I would, I believe they're doing um, in-person programs over there this year. Of course, with COVID protocols, you know, masking and social distancing and all of that sort of stuff. But uh, 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 reach out to Vermilion County Conservation District and see if, if you'd like to go to an in-person program, you can go to one of those one of their maple syrup programs, or even, you know, purchase some maple syrup from them over there. But uh, also here in central Illinois, uh, not too far from us, about an hour away in McLean County, close to Bloomington Normal, Illinois, uh, notable uh, uh, syrup place, Funks Grove, pure maple syrup, um, is a popular uh, uh, syrup processing location here in central Illinois. And uh, notice the spelling, uh, is different from normal spelling uh, with an I instead of a Y. John, do you know why that is? I, I remember hearing about it, but I, 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 I can't quite remember the exact reason why. I honestly couldn't tell you. I thought it was, you know, a deliberate anachronism, but I have no idea. It's not yeah. because it's French. Yeah. <laughs> French yeah, would be I, OP. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if that was, I, I can't remember if somebody said it was the original spelling of syrup or not or, or what, but I, I don't know exactly. But Funk Grove, Pure Maple Syrup, check it out. I know that uh, this time of the year when they have uh, made syrup, it sells out pretty quickly. So get your hands on some Funk Grove Maple Syrup because uh, it is quite popular in this area. I also saw, I don't have it in this presentation, but uh, Macon County Conservation District um, in Decatur. Um, they're doing some maple syruping programs this year as well in person, again, with COVID protocols. So if you're in the Decatur area here in central Illinois, uh, go check out Macon County Conservation, Conservation District um, and their maple syrup programs. Lastly, you know, since John told you everything you need and what you need to do, if you have some maple trees, tap them in your own backyard and see if you can make your very own maple syrup since we gave you all the tools and all the steps tonight so with that um that's the end of our presentation um uh, for making maple syrup of your very own and uh, i want to thank john uh, for helping out with the program tonight and if you have any questions as i mentioned and as it says at the bottom of the screen write those down below we'd love to answer some of your questions i'm going to do some moderating of the chat here uh to see which questions we have coming in um, so Leslie asks, uh, I think you went over this, John, will the sap start running later this year due to the cold spell? Oh yeah. Okay. It, it, as soon as, as soon as it starts to thaw, I was looking at the weather. It's, we're still, we're still locked in for at least another week. Uh, but as soon, you know, at, at the end of February, beginning of March, I'm going to get restless and probably I was, I was starting to think we had a warm middle of January, if you remember. And I was almost going to test it then, but I decided not to, and I'm glad I didn't. Um, so yeah, it 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 will start. It will always start. It just uh, you know whenever it starts to thaw. Uh, Mary is asking. I, b I believe she means to say, does it hurt the tree if you take too much sap? And I I think you addressed that a little bit um, in the. Uh, middle of the presentation, of, you know, as far as how many uh, spiles to put into a tree. But John, do you think it'll hurt the tree if you take too much sap? I mean, especially a younger tree probably wouldn't want to tap it too much. But no, and and if it were younger and you try to do it multiple places, you'd probably get to the part of the the um, the inside of the tree, the core of the tree, where there's no xylem. So it's not gonna it's not gonna uh, work anyway. Uh, but no, I don't think so. And and. If you're thinking in terms of overall length of time, it's self-limiting. It's not gonna. It's not going to. I'm. I'm fairly confident that these trees can take it. My trees uh, have not gonna hurt. Uh, Leslie asked, "Do you have sugar in your events that are open to the public?" So as I mentioned, we typically do this program every year in late February, early March. 
Um, but of course, with COVID this year, uh, we decided to just do it virtually. But um, you know, check back next year in 2022. We'll do these programs again. And uh, as I mentioned before, if you're in Central Illinois or if you're local, check out uh, uh, Vermilion County Conservation District or Macon County Conservation District, as I know they're doing programs in the area this year. Of course, space is limited and there's COVID protocols in place. Uh, so you may want to look into that information. Or, you know, if you're not in Central Illinois, chances are there might be other conservation districts or forces of districts or local syrup processors who may do similar programs. So uh, just take a look around and see what you can find. Uh, but check back with CCFPD, Campaign County Forest Reserve District next year. And um, hopefully we can do it then. Uh, Kara asks, what happens if you don't skim the foam off in the processing phase? John, do you know what would happen if you didn't that's do that? A, that's an interesting question. I think, I mean, nothing ultimately. You could certainly still consume the, uh, the thing. It would just be a little bit less pleasant. I think it would it would be cloudier. Um, it's not going to hurt you. Nothing nothing that's in there is is toxic or anything. It's just you want to have a, as clear a liquid as you can to because we expect the syrup to be clear. Uh, but it's also you know a way of tending to it. It's not that it's not that time consuming. I'll do that you know once or twice an hour while it's cooking. So uh, it's not that hard. Um, Jan is asking oh, yeah. about the sugar sand that you talked about. Is that something that you would discard? Yeah, that gets filtered out when you're passing it through the. Um, through the uh, cheesecloth as well. It's it's fine, but it's not that fine. Um, and it's as, as I would pour that pour the syrup as it's cooking through the cheesecloth, then it gets it's gone. It's not sugar. It is not. It doesn't taste good. Uh, and well, also <laughs> an interesting story here: a friend tapped a sugar maple tree located in a city. And was sad to taste it since the syrup tasted like sewer. Oh boy! Apparently the roots were wrapped around sewer pipes. Well, um, that that brings up a point too. And another question that people typically ask at this program each year is, can I mean why why maple trees? Why tap maple trees? I mean, can you tap any tree, or is there a reason why you tap maple trees? Um, and uh, I know that maple trees have some of the highest sugar content out of uh, all the trees. Uh, that we have especially in this area but john do you know i mean can you tap any any old tree yeah. or what yeah um it's certainly most deciduous trees that will have sap they may not have much sugar the one that i i hear periodically mentioned we have a large hackberry tree in our front yard and um i know that hackberry has been used as i don't think it's very pleasant but it i think it was used as a medicinal uh syrup as well so uh, you know, as possible, I wouldn't want to mix them though. You'd, you'd ruin the the sugar maple. That, yeah, I, uh, that about the sewer pipe. I'm going to probably steal that and pretend that I knew it in the first place because I love it. <laughs> yeah, it's. I, I guess you know the tree is what it eats. You know, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I've also heard uh, black walnut trees. You know, maybe tap those. Um, I was talking to another staff member today. She did say not to tap a cherry tree because of you know harmful material harmful materials in that in there. And Barb and I were talking today about you know well you're not supposed to eat the pits of stone fruits like cherries and and you know peaches yeah, for for, yeah. for similar reasons. So I think um, they have a small, small amount of arsenic. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, Denise. Sorry. Denise, uh, asked, do you drill the hole at an up angle? Yeah, so. Yeah, John, I was going to ask too if you could show. Pretend this tree next to me is a tree. I would, I would drill that way. Not that, probably not that much of an angle like that. And then, um, then the spile. It, 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 it would work if you drilled it, you know, so that the spile went to the at an up angle, but it wouldn't pour out. It would, it would take more trouble for the. Uh, there's not a lot of pressure coming from the tree. There's a little bit of capillary action to push the liquid out, but it's more just gravity. So you want to help gravity by the by the angle of the of the spile coming out of the tree. These are good questions. Yeah. Also, uh, hi, Mary Margaret. I, I didn't say hello to you before. Uh, <laughs> That's um, a, this is a very good question. Um, one of the things that I had to learn kind of the hard way is it will go bad. Um, 
it's it's best to keep I, you know you're processing it so you figure that it's also kind of pasteurizing it in some way uh, I, if I keep it refrigerated, it will last for long, long, long years and years. Uh, if I don't, it will gather, um, well, I don't know if it's a organic matter or if it's just uh, sediment that's still settling in it, but there will be, you know, the, it will get ruined if I leave it out um, on the shelf for more than a year, say. So I always, I just always refrigerate everything that I make. Um, Ann uh, has a, a story. I used to live in Canada. I remember going on a field trip in fourth or fifth grade, learning about maple trees. We got to taste maple syrup on fresh snow, real life snow cone there. That sounds that sounds yep. pretty good. Yeah, this is a. I, I was going to say the one the one good thing about doing this this way this year is normally on a on a maple syrup day, I will spend eight hours outside um, next to a lake, and the lake has been frozen solid on some cases. Uh, in snow, sometimes mostly in a lot of mud, uh, because this time of year it can be very variable. But when there is snow, uh, the the idea of pouring almost complete maple syrup on fresh snow is just lovely because it will crystallize as as you do that as well. And that is a very Canadian thing when you go to the Sucre. Um, Anne also asked, well, she says, "Thank you. I learned a lot today. Is it acceptable to try and tap a sugar maple tree from a local park?" Um, I, I would, you know, you can't, it, at least at CCFPD, you can't come and tap our trees without permission, of course, but um, I would make sure to get permission from wherever if it's not your own tree. Um, but uh, uh, if, if they've tapped the trees and made their own maple syrup, um, as long as they've done it honestly and responsibly, I would say it would be trustworthy to try. So. I've heard, especially uh, well. I know in Urbana, there there have um, there have been neighborhoods that have kind of done this as a co-op, so that all the maple trees that were like in common from the people that were in the neighborhood, they did it. That's a that's a very good idea, but I, apparently it's also very hard to uh, manage because somebody has to be in charge of the boiling, and uh, you know you can get everybody to collect it, but then when you when you're actually doing the thing, who has the responsibility? Um, I mean, I like doing it by myself, but I could see if there was a, a bunch of people with, you know, 10 or 12 trees in a neighborhood, it would, you would be able to make quite a good bit and yeah. share it all. But parks, I wouldn't, I wouldn't just walk into a park. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yep. And as I mentioned over at Forest Glen, uh, County Preserve in Vermilion County, uh, they have a maple grove and they have an event each year, this year. Um, so not too far away from us here in Champaign County. Uh, they're doing that over in Vermilion County. Well, that seems to be all of our questions. I appreciate everybody for asking questions. Those were good questions, as John mentioned. I uh, appreciate John. Uh, again, thank you for for helping with this program this year, again, virtually. Um, and uh, thanks to everybody for watching tonight. Uh, if you have any more questions, feel free to write those down in the comments section. Uh, we'll, we'll check them out after this program is over. Um, well, I'll, I'll keep tabs on it and, and get back to you. Um, but uh, stay tuned for more programs. Uh, come and see us next year uh, for Maple Sugar Days 2022. Uh, we, hope you, we hope you all have a good uh, rest of your evening. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay. <laughs> It's, uh, you know, I still, Barbara and I are on, on our end, there's a private chat function and we're still laughing about, you know, some of the things that, you know, yeah. John says there. Yeah. <laughs> um, when he said, I, I, I don't like maple syrup, I just like to give it away. It was like so perfectly, John. I know. I, I, I was, I was going to say that I said, I, you know, I said it in that program last year. I always found it funny because he would say this every year. And everybody would always laugh and be like, you know, I don't even like maple syrup, but you know, he just, he liked to cook and he liked to use it in cooking, but then he also knew others, you know, in, in his family or, you know, would give it away to others. So he made it for them. So just goes to show, you know, the care he had for, you know, what he enjoyed to do as well as the care for those so close to him, you know? So, um, yeah, but that always made me laugh. Like you don't even like to do it, you know, but, uh, but you still do. Um, so I wanted to get to one of the comments right away because I know that it's a young lady that's probably past her bedtime. 
Um, and those are the comments of Isabella Madrigal, which oh, isn't okay. her real name, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they were they were our neighbors for many years, and she says she loves. Yeah, there you go. She loves to have maple syrup. It goes great with waffles. She couldn't wait for the program. She wanted to know what sap is. Sap is the water that flows up from the ground into the tree, from the roots to the top of the tree. And it also carries with it a lot of nutrients, minerals, things that the tree needs. So I think that's it. Hopefully that's enough of an answer for you. There, Isabella slash Emily, how long does it take? That, that was another question. And, um, when John said he brought in 40 gallons, I think it's like three gallons, per, three hours per 10 gallons to boil it down to the point where you can bring it in the house. And then you do it back another half hour there. So you might like want to budget four hours for 10 gallons of, of sap. Um, so if you're doing 40 gallons, that's like, I don't know, a couple days. Um, and there, was there anything else I didn't answer of Isabella's? I hope that they're still there. Oh, so good to see his face and hear his voice. That's so sweet. Thank you. <laughs> okay. That's, I just wanted to be sure because I knew that um, that was our our neighbor and, and that was at least one of the kids was watching. So well, cool. Um, yeah. So yeah. If, if, if anybody else has any other questions or, memories to share we've had some great memories shared in the comments so far um oh my uh, gosh they just they just warm my heart so much you guys yeah <laughs> i just uh, some of them just cracked me up so we saw this one from isabella <laughs> yeah. um uh diane great to hear you my thoughts are with you that was uh, sweet thank you diane um eileen John and Barb, girls uh, and girls were our wonderful neighbors for a number of years. John was also a great coworker and neighbor. Took a picture of my daughter and I chatting with John on July 4th at our neighborhood celebration. There was John holding one of their beautiful babies, a frequent sight. John loved kids. He really did. <laughs> and he was always in charge of 4th of July because I was always in the band. So he had to, he had to take over there, but he didn't mind. It was, it was natural to him. Um, Eileen and John worked together at the Champaign Public Library a million years ago. Okay. <laughs> well, not a million years ago, Eileen, okay, but <laughs> it was a long time ago. <laughs> um, Jenny says, miss you, John, so knowledgeable on so many subjects. Yeah, he, you know, knew his stuff, that's for sure, yeah. Jenny is a German teacher at uni, and um, I, I think they enjoyed language together as well as many other things. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, Allison, there's our guy, John Garvey. Can't wait to talk. This was right, uh, right when he was getting ready to start. Our lovey John, yeah. <laughs> He's he, Allison's a friend from grad school, and it, that was perfect, Allison, and it made me laugh. Allison, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, Myra said, "I talked to John about maple syrup as my sister-in-law taps trees every year. He said her operation of 82 plus trees, a ton of trees, was much." A much bigger production than his. Yeah, I would say. Myra is a friend of mine from high school, but she lives in northern Michigan. So, of course, her sister in law has access to a whole bunch more trees than we do. <laughs> Thank you. I'm really glad Myra came too. That was so wonderful. I think she had to sign out early, but uh, yeah, I wanted to I, say thanks. I saw that. That was wonderful. And, and Dominique, uh, it was great to see you too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Dominique, so glad she made it to this. Thank you for this program. She really misses teaching with John. Such a great guy. They taught they te taught uh, computer literacy together at uni. Gotcha. Um, Eileen, thank you for sharing this, Barb. Great to see you. Um, Ray Ray asked a question. Ray Klein. Oh yes, you can can it. Um, I I of course quickly googled that to make sure that. <laughs> that it was right but yes you can you can can it and i would i would do appropriate internet research to find out how to do that precisely but it sounds like it's pretty much like canning preserves so you should be able to do that to store it um well we never bothered because we really didn't get that much that we couldn't put it in our refrigerator so yeah okay uh, Nike says sailing at Clinton Lake. 
John didn't mind the mud. Not much of a sand beach for our launch area. So Sharon, sharing that memory. Yeah, that's a little known thing about John. He loved, he grew up in close to Chesapeake Bay and he loved to sail and he loved boats and it was not that easy to do around here. So, yeah. Uh, our friend Katie from the museum. Nice to hear John, the teacher, doing his thing. My kids and the kids from their classes at uni all commented when he passed on. What a kind man he always was to all the kids. Katie, thank you. I don't know what to say to that one. <laughs> uh, Brian uh, says, this is Laura Sweet and Ryan McCarthy. John was my French teacher at uni in the 90s. Uh, I have so many memories of him cooking with our class. He was such a wonderful teacher and a wonderful person. Um, he also says that uh, also Ryan and I got married at the Maple Grove at Homer Lake. So this is really special. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah. <laughs> what, a, what a really great connection. Yeah. So that's awesome. Thank Laura you. Sweet. Sweet. <laughs> yeah. Laura Sweet too. Yeah. Thank you, Laura and Ryan. Really appreciate that. So yeah, Laura, John always remembered you too. So yeah, that was very kind. Thank these you. are these are all great memories. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was going to say that, you know, the first time that uh, my my first interaction and in working with John, um, one of the first big programs I did at the museum uh, was our annual Prairie Stories program where we have a bunch of demonstrations and activities going on all centered around 19th century uh, Central Illinois history. And John uh, uh, typically helps with uh, uh, outdoor cooking demonstrations for that program. And uh, I placed him to do Dutch oven cooking over a campfire on a super hot September day out in the Discovery Garden with basically no shade. And <laughs> he was out there the entire day, cooking the entire day. And I went out there multiple times and just to check on him. And it was a hot September day. You know, sometimes it can get a little warm in, you know, early September when these programs take place. And John's over a fire, too. And he's working and and teaching and talking to people about all these things. But at the same time, there's just sweat, like pouring like a like a faucet off of his nose. And like, you know, maybe even my wedding day, <laughs> yeah, maybe even sizzling over the fire. And I'm like, John, do you need anything? Do you need <laughs> water something to drink take a break in the shade and absolutely refuses every single time doesn't want to stop doesn't want to stop working doesn't want to stop cooking doesn't want to stop interacting with people and i think i even talked to you about it and you and uh, your daughter uh madeline you know offered you know hey you know take a break or here's something to drink and i i think he was still either accepting very little or still refusing um you know because he we was, always had without there with his coffee coffee yeah right like not gonna hydrate you and the other thing is he would get so tense about doing it he was afraid he wasn't gonna have all the right things he was afraid he wasn't gonna do it right he was afraid people weren't gonna want to pay attention you know and then he'd get out there and he'd be in his in the zone and he wouldn't want to stop even to drink some water yeah. so he was <laughs> he, he he cared a lot about it he was really committed um you know maybe a little <laughs> Maybe he says that man would not take a drink of water. <laughs> yeah. And a little stubborn. Yeah, for sure. Definitely a little stubborn. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll always remember that. Just the amount of sweat that was pouring off, pouring off his nose on that day. I felt, I felt bad, but he came back to, you know, he came back the next year and did it again. So, um, you know, it was, it was good. So Mayan has a nice, nice one too. Yeah. Mayan watching this with my two little ones and sharing with them about how fun Mr. Garvey was as my teacher at uni. He taught me computer literacy, but somehow inspired my friends and I to create our own fashion magazine for what could have been a much more mundane lesson. Nothing was ever boring with him. Uh, Akiba and Zavi, uh, forgive me if I mispronounce those. My kids are excited to tap our maple tree and make our own syrup. So, you know, that's, that's the great thing about this this program we did last year. You know, it's uh, the recording lives on. So he's still, you know, um, he's still teaching. still teaching, you know, still doing his thing. Uh, it's 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 really great that that we have that. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was that was uh, that. I mean, and that is that's true. And then you, your legacy as a teacher. And there are many people who are on here tonight who were teachers lives on with your students forever. So yeah, even if there aren't recordings, right? Yeah. If you do it well, it lives on. And that's a lovely thing. And yeah. 
we do that at the museum all the time, but <laughs> that we do. That yeah. we do. But you know, maybe maybe that's a good note to end on. You know, uh, with with the program, I don't see any um, any other memories coming in at the moment. But feel free to continue to share those memories with us. Uh, ask us any questions you may have. Tune back in, you know, to to hear the presentation again. Um, but really appreciate you know you doing this tonight, Barb. Um, really appreciate everybody tuning in and sharing your memories. Uh, uh, really awesome to read those. Um, Really awesome. And the, and the program was still great, guys. I mean, so much good information. People actually ask questions not about John. You know, they ask questions yeah. about making maple syrup. And that's 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 so cool. I'm I'm really glad we did this. I was really I was a little bit worried about it. Cause you know, you know me, I leak at the drop of a hat, but <laughs> but it was good. It was very good. And and um I was glad to to see him and glad to see all the people who who came so um when he was uh talking about there being arsenic in the uh pits of cherries and and peach and i and even though i knew it was a recording i said no it's cyanide and then two seconds later he said cyanide and <laughs> this is my entire life <laughs> <laughs> bickering about details <laughs> but it was it was great great that was really great to to remember that john was also about precision so indeed i think i remember you telling me you, you would you um you guys would go to restaurants and you'd find mistakes on menus and he always had a red pen he would like <laughs> <laughs> if it was a paper menu, I'd let him correct it. <laughs> let him write on one that wasn't paper. But it was, but language was really important to him too. Yeah. As, as Jenny and Dominique know, right? So, yeah. yeah, yeah. And as you said, he he translated the our couple of our programs into French and our and our some of our flyers into French. So yeah, yeah, that uh it did did quite a bit of work, you know, for us doing that, which was greatly appreciated. And I think there's there's even a video on our YouTube page where um we did a program for welcoming week where he it was basically a short guided tour of the museum, but it's in French. Um and John and John did the narration for that. Um, that's so right. That's, that's right. That's really great. So if you're yeah. if you if you want to watch that, um, you want to watch a, a short guided tour of the museum in French, go to our Facebook and YouTube page that that John narrated. Did a really really awesome job with that too. So. Yeah. So so one you know final word. Um, if you're married to somebody who works in a museum, you will actually end up volunteering for a museum. <laughs> we call it voluntold. <laughs> Well, yeah. thanks, thanks, Pat, for doing this, and thank you, everybody, for coming. It was wonderful. Yeah. Anybody have any last questions? Uh, we can answer them, but I think yeah, we'll... Pat and I probably need to quit working for the day. <laughs> well, thank you, Barb. Thank you, everybody, again for tuning in. Thanks to John uh, for doing a great program last year and uh, continue to lives on. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. But all right. Well, until next time, everybody. Thank you again so much for a great evening. Uh, we'll see you again.